Hello and welcome to The Woman Show. I'm Lini Nudasul and today we are speaking about access to justice for survivors of gender-based violence. Now here on The Woman Show we've spoken quite often about secondary trauma and the secondary victimization of survivors of gender-based violence when they enter the justice system, either when they report to the police or to other stakeholders and going through the court process. After the break, we're going to be speaking to Zintle Kobeni, who is the founder of The Great People of South Africa, an organization that is training community members to become informal paralegals and assist victims of gender-based violence to better navigate the system. But before we go into that conversation, let's have a look about, at a short video about access to justice and gender-based violence. Let's have a look. Meet Sarah. She grew up in a community a lot like yours. Sarah recently married and moved into a new home with her husband, not far from her parents. Soon after her wedding, Sarah's new home began to feel like a prison. Her husband wouldn't let her leave the house, even to work or see her family. He insulted her, yelled at her, and hit her. He forced her to have sex when she didn't want to. Sarah doesn't know she can seek help. She feels lost and isolated, too ashamed and scared to tell her parents, too embarrassed to tell her friends. But Sarah isn't alone. Across the world, at least one in three women will experience physical and or sexual violence, mainly at the hands of their husbands or partners. This can happen whether they're legally married, living together, or just dating. Women and girls also experience a number of other forms of violence over the course of their lives, from family members, acquaintances, and strangers. This violence can hurt them emotionally and physically, and can have serious impact on their health. Experiencing violence can prevent women and girls from completing their education, doing work, and earning an income. This violence affects their families, their communities, and entire nations. Yet the majority of women and girls who experience violence never seek help. Why? In many countries, it's not so easy to find help. And like Sarah, many women don't know they have the right to seek these services. They worry about their family's reaction, or fear even more violence. And sometimes, even when they seek help, providers don't have the right skills to meet their needs. But these barriers are a wall that can be torn down. Responding to this violence requires a range of essential services that recognize and aim to meet the multiple needs of women who have experienced violence, survivors. Quality health services must offer first-line support. Quality social services must offer information on rights and access to critical resources. Effective police and justice services must be cross-cutting and women-centered. From reporting to a police officer and speaking with a lawyer, to getting support for any matters heard by a court, these services must ensure confidentiality and protection. When these services are available and well coordinated, getting help to stop the violence and to recover from its effects becomes more possible. Sarah's is only one story. There are countless others. With proper services, women like Sarah can get the support they need to break the cycle of violence. Spread the word. Take action. Stop violence against women and girls. That was a short video on access to justice. We are going to take a short break, but we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show, and we are speaking about access to justice more specifically for victims of gender-based violence. And joining me in studio is Zintle Kobeni, who is the founder of The Great People of South Africa. And what The Great People of South Africa are doing is they are training people in the community and teaching them some legal skills in order to assist victims of GBV. Zintle, welcome, and thank you for joining us. 
Well, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. And we, we it's, I'm so happy to have you because, Dintle, you know, we have spoken so much about secondary victimization and secondary trauma on the show. And for those who don't know, what that is really is when after something bad has happened or after a violent episode has happened and the victim goes to the police station or into the justice system to report, they experience secondary trauma there because processes are not followed, their stories are dismissed. And simply your organization was, uh, uh, was founded in order to help victims navigate the system. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's very, very true. Um, the organization assists victims and survivors to navigate through the criminal justice system, which is quite a brutal system. Mm -hmm. um, we're speaking about secondary victimization. This is where mostly um, you know, victims and survivors experience this, as you said, from the police station. Um, if, for example, you're a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, you go and you report um, you know, a, a crime of violence that you've experienced, they will laugh at you. If you are a woman and you are wearing in a certain way and you go in and report that you have been raped, they will not believe you. In fact, they will say, it is your fault. Why were you dressed like that? Why were you out? Why were you walking in a particular place? So secondary victimization is very, very, very much real. It is out there. And unfortunately, the system is not doing much to protect victims and survivors who report these cases of gender-based violence. Mm. Simply in like you raising such important sort of examples of what happens when people do go, and also examples of why people are afraid to go and report. Now, um, you know, within the press release about the wonderful work that you're doing, it was also said that you yourself are a survivor. And often we found that people who enter this work is because they've experienced some sort of injustice themselves. And so, is was that part of the reason why you founded the Great People of South Africa and why? Uh, you feel like something needs to be done in order for people to better access the system. 100%. I am a survivor of sexual violence. In 2015, I was raped while I was still staying in Joburg. I then moved to Cape Town. This is where I also experienced a sexual assault, which I did not uh, report to the second incident. The reason for that is simply because I was already victimized. Um, I experienced secondary victimization in, in Johannesburg, and the police failed me. So when I moved to Cape Town and this incident happened, I did not report it because I did not see the need to report it to the police because they were probably not going to do anything about it. And I also feared secondary victimization from my new teammates, which I had just uh, met, and just the fear that my employer at the time maybe will suggest that I go back to Joburg, which I did not want to go back to, to Johannesburg. So from that experience, it, it, that experience, in fact, gave birth to the organization. I wanted to make sure that the next Zintle out there who's mm -hmm. going to be sexually violated, who's going to experience domestic violence or any type of gender-based violence is shielded from um, experience, uh, experiencing secondary victimization. And just, you know, the entire failure of the criminal justice system, I wanted to make sure that nobody ever goes through what I went through. Zintle, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you something so interesting because you say, um, that you also didn't want to experience secondary victimization at work. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've raised before is that it's not just the justice system. We've seen time and time again that when someone is sexually assaulted, they're assaulted by someone that they know, yep. and automatically that, for, that is within a community of people that know both the victim and perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And so is that also something, you, something that you hear about often when you guys are dealing with victims? Does that also come through? We not only hear about it, um, but we, we get to see it. Mm. Um, vi secondary victimization, like you said, it's not only you know, within the criminal justice system, it's within the communities as well. Um, it's within the families as well. You know, when you report and your auntie says, we can't report the uncle because they, they provide for us, mm. but maybe you led your uncle on or your father on. This, these are things that are actually happening. These are things that are being said to victims. And that is why I'm saying that, you know, secondary victimization is something that is very, very much real. And that is what actually discourages a lot of uh, other victims from, um, you know, reporting. Hence, I did not um, report the second incident because I just feared that, you know, I will not be believed. Mm. Yeah, I and mean, maybe I'll be blamed for, for going out the night before. Can I ask you, so, <clears throat> 
you know, you, the, this story of the secondary victimization that we're speaking about, and again, you know, within the justice system, but also within the community. Um, I want to ask within your own personal experience, but also with the people, um, the survivors that you have dealt with. Someone on Facebook uh, made a comment yesterday. Mm. We were speaking about sort of, you know, microaggressions in the workplace mm. or comments or, or procedures that aren't really followed. It wasn't mm. sexual assault related, but it was interesting from a systems perspective. Mm. And she had said she had uh, spoken about certain things within an institution mm. that was problematic. And other people who work there within that institution told her, it's better not to say anything, do not make trouble, et cetera. But the comment that really struck me was that she said the, the caution or the messages that were deterring me from speaking out were almost more traumatic than the thing that was wrong. And so, um, for and I ideally want to speak to audience members out there who are being deterred or are being, you know, what you said now, uh, maybe you led your uncle on certain comments like that. What does that do to a person? It re-traumatizes them. Um, it takes it, it affects their mental uh, well-being as well, because from experiencing a trauma, well, from having a, 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 a traumatic experience to being blamed mm. um, for experiencing that. It is quite, it's mentally disturbing. It affects people's mental health. That's why most people, um, you will find that they resort to al alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. drug abuse, and some even go as far as committing suicide because it's very, very difficult. It's already difficult to come forward and, and report this and to be victimized for that. It's a very, very, very difficult thing, and I'm speaking from experience. And it's a difficult thing to be blamed and just to give it a name. It's called, there's, there's a thing called victim blaming, yeah. right? Yep. Where you were saying, and again, another story that I was sent uh, via Facebook is someone, uh, you know, who was assaulted early in the morning on the way to gym mm. and was asked by a police officer, well, what were you doing outside at five o'clock in the morning? There you go. And so this speaks to the fact that we, we need to police ourselves constantly, especially as women, in terms of where we're supposed to go, almost as if the thing that happened to us is our own fault. Definitely. And so, Zint, so Zintle, I want to ask you, so w w you've started the Great People of South Africa. Mm -hmm. What it is is a program that it puts community members through mm -hmm. and they learn uh, sort of legal, the legal framework or how the legal system works. You're, yeah. you're calling them informal paralegal. Yeah. It's, a, it's a paralegal program, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, tell us what are some of the things that they are learning. Okay, so we do have a range of other programs such as self-defense, uh, mm -hmm. community outreach programs, but with this um, particular program, which is an informal um, community-based paralegal training, we empower or we, 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 we're aiming to empower you know, young women. Young men are also starting to participate as well, which is a good thing because we cannot solve the issue of gender-based violence without inviting men to the conversation. So this program uh, seeks to empower them with basic legal skills so that they can be able to respond um, to issues of domestic violence and just ge general gender-based violence um, incidents within their communities. Uh, we're speaking about secondary victimization today. But when you look at, um, our, of these, at these trainees who are in the program, most of them, if not 80% of them, are actually victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Why do we specifically look at recruiting those kind of people? Because they have experienced gender-based violence, and so most people are reluctant to report to the police, so it makes it easier for them to report to these um, uh, paralegals because this is someone that has gone through the same experience as you, and they will definitely show some you know, compassion and some Ubuntu when, mm -hmm. um, you know, responding to, 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 to the case. So that is what we do. We teach them um, the, the basics of the law. We teach them how to navigate this, the, the, the system, who to speak to when you get to the police station, what documents you need to look out for, how to make sure that, you know, statements are being correctly taken by the police because the police really do, you know, um, I think it was, it was just between uh, July and September as we were in the low, uh, lockdown, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, during the, the lockdown, yeah. and there was just over 92 cases that were struck off court roll due to police inefficiency. And that includes statements that were not taken correctly by the police. So that should be 
uh, worrying factor to, to, to us. And that is what also motivated us to ensure that we continue with this program so that we can deploy these people in different communities, especially those that have been highlighted as gender-based violence hotspots within the city of Cape Town, just to make sure that we prevent uh, secondary victimization. By speaking to someone who has experienced this, um, like I said, they will definitely be able to show some compassion towards you. Yes, and I mean, you're talking about such an important issue in the fact that we're looking at a criminal justice system, we're looking at harm was perpetrated, and so now a process needs to kick in. And yet, sure. what you are saying is that something, and you are also, I'd like to mention, a third year law student, right? So you know what you're talking about, that something can just be struck off the door, not because of a lack of evidence or, or um, because, you know, something, uh, the victim or survivor did something wrong, but rather because a single process wasn't followed properly within yeah. that system. Mm -hmm. And so it's vital for someone to find justice in order to, to do those processes properly, correct? Yep, that is 100% correct. And so um, we have spoken about very much the statement taking. So this is an issue that has come up. It's come up in the media a lot of the time. Um, w just to empower some of the citizens out there, what is important uh, to know around this process of statement taking? So when you, when you, and I, I think I'm asking, when you train them and they go along with the victims and they try to make sure that something is taken down properly, mm -hmm. a, a surprising thing that I learned recently is that you can ask for a copy of your statement. Yes, you can actually. And I didn't know that. You can definitely ask for a copy of your statement. In fact, you don't actually have to ask for it. They should offer it to you. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I um, opened this uh, uh, case that uh, I'm, I'm currently um, going through right now. Um, the, the police officer that assisted me, I will remain forever eternally grateful to them. They made sure that, first of all, I was in a particular room that is safe where I can feel comfortable mm -hmm. for this statement to be taken because you can't take a statement right there where everybody else is at. And this is something that actually ha happens in a lot of uh, police stations, especially in marginalized communities. The police really don't care. They will get you to make a statement right there in front of everybody else. It's crazy. Well, what it they're supposed happen. to do is take you to the, I think it's called the victim friendly room, right? hundred percent, yes. That's where they need to take you. So when I walked in at this police station uh, where I was going to lay this criminal case, uh, the, police, the, the police officer that assisted me, when they found out what I was there for, they immediately said, okay, cool. Come, let's go in that room. I went in that room. It was quiet. And I, I spoke my truth there. I explained to them what had happened. And the questions that they were asking me they really assisted me also, you know, to play back, um, you know, some of the scenes that actually happened on that day. So I was in a comfortable space for me to be able to do that mm -hmm. so that I can be able to, you know, to speak about what transpired, how it happened, the dates, um, what people were wearing, um, who said what, and, 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 and all of that. So, 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 so the way the police receive um, victims and survivors of gender-based violence when they come to the police station is extremely uh, important. It, it, like I said, it must have some kind of Ubuntu um, uh, in it to, to, to make sure that the, the, the victim is, is, is more comfortable to, to detail what happened to them and that they don't leave out anything because part of taking a statement is part of collecting evidence. Um, the statement that the victim makes um, or the survivor makes is very, very crucial for the um, prosecutors to, to, to be able to successfully prosecute a case. So it's very, very important that, you know, this institution, the, the Department of Police or the SAPS, um, I don't know, they try and train their police on how to better respond and how to treat victims and survivors of gender-based violence. If they do that, then we'll definitely um, prevent uh, secondary victimization. You know, Zentle, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful first of all, to you for sharing that experience to us. We are well aware because of reports in the news of what can go, what can go and what does go wrong yes. when victims try to report and they don't get um, the proper processes or procedures or even are, you know, their dignity is really stripped by the way that they are treated. And it is, I think, good and useful for us and I think for people everywhere to sort of hear what a good process sounds like. Yeah. You know, to be able to go in there and know this and, 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 and know that this is the type of experience that I 
um, should expect to get, yeah. or I should be getting from someone. And I think what came through for me, really, as you were speaking, is that you know you, you called it a comfortable space, but I think what they created was a safe space. Yeah. And, and what came through through to me in light of the last question is that you didn't feel blamed. Is that correct? No, I, I, I did not feel blamed at all. In fact, um, be, because I was reporting an incident that happened in 2015, I finally had confidence to you know come forward and report this. And the police officer said to me, don't even feel ashamed. Don't even feel bad that you are reporting now because there's never a good time or a bad time mm -hmm. to report such incidents. So it was a safe space that was created for me. I'm very grateful for it. And I'm really, really hoping that the criminal justice system will do everything that they can to make sure that justice is, ser is served in this case. Wow, and so I don't know who that cop is, but I just want to give a shout out actually and to say thank you for sort of that sort of empathy and that yeah. sort of, um, I think that sort of treatment of a case of gender-based violence. I want to ask, if I may, and only if you're comfortable speaking mm. about it, right, because you said the reason why you didn't report actually the second time was mm. because of your first experience. Yeah. So, you know, what was different about the first experience? What was, was traumatizing? Um, what was different about the first experience in terms of reporting it, um, after I was raped, so I was walking around and I was crying um, out for help, and there was a mama that came out of her yard. She actually says that she thought I was her daughter because her daughter is actually in a, an abusive relationship. And she came out, and she's actually the one that actually called the police. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, I always think about it, I'm not sure if I would have maybe reported it because of the stigma that is attached to being raped, you know, where people start talking about you and looking at you in a certain way and having some conversations about you on the side. I, 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 I don't know, but it was, it was that mama that actually called the police and that is how I came about to, to you know, being um, in, a, in a position to report the case. And like I said, the second incident, because the police took this, a statement, but they were not really, they, they really didn't care, yeah. you know? And also again, I think at the time, I was not empowered with you know, legal knowledge yes. as to what needs to happen. And that's why I went as far as going to empower myself with information. And that's what also gave me confidence to say, you know what, right now I am ready. I will stand my ground. I will stand up for myself and other people, other victims out there that, that remain nameless mm -hmm. uh, for now. And I will use the skills and the knowledge and the experience that I have to make sure that the perpetrator is held accountable. And so, I think that was the difference between the two um, experiences. At first, I really didn't know much about uh, the criminal justice system, how I needed to be treated, how my statement was supposed to be taken, and all of that. But now I know, and that's why I'm fighting. And I mean, that's what's so important about sharing our stories and talking about this, is that people can be empowered. Um, I often say, and I mean, it's, it's also the reason why, how the women's show got started, was that the first, we learn nothing. <laughs> we learn nothing throughout mm -hmm. our lives about this sort of thing. Often mm -hmm. the first interaction with the justice system or the police mm -hmm. is after something happened to you. And I often refer to it as a deer caught in the headlights mm -hmm. because you don't really know what must happen here. Yeah. And you don't really know if things, are, if things go wrong, that that thing is wrong yeah. until possibly you're one of the 92% of cases that get yeah. dropped yeah. Um, because of uh, the procedure not being followed. Mm -hmm. um, we need to take a short break, but we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show, and we are speaking about access to justice specifically for victims and survivors of gender-based violence. And with us in studio is Zintle Kubeni from the organization Great Pe The Great People of South Africa, which she founded in order to share um, or train community members in legal services so that they may offer these. And so Zintle, you know, what was lovely to see in the press release when I was reading it mm. is that you would like to have a paralegal in every community in South Africa. And given that we were speaking about sort of you know, how secondary victimization and secondary trauma comes from not just the justice system or after one reports, but also from your immediate environment. It could be your family, your community, your school, your work, you mentioned as an option. Um, how important is it for 
us to have these services available within communities? It's very, very important because we are a country in a crisis, very, very violent country, and women, um, you know, children, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, including people are, that are living with disabilities, are very much prone to violence. Mm. So we don't only have to respond to gender-based violence, but we need to prevent it. Mm. So it's very important that we place each, in each and every street, in fact, um, a community-based paralegal, because they can not only just um, you know, help with gender-based violence um, cases, but they can also help to prevent and respond to human rights violations. Mm -hmm. um, how do I mean by that? Um, for an example, with most of the uh, gender-based violence cases that we come across, we have noted that most of the women um, stay in these relationships simply because they don't have an ID document. Oh, wow. Yeah. If they don't have an ID document, it means that the children don't have birth certificates. If the children don't have birth certificates, it means that they're not accessing social grant. So they stay in these relationships because they are financially dependent on the perpetrator and they are unable to live because who will support them financially? So those are some of the issues that we, we, we assist with. We help them um, take them through the Department of Home Affairs, who have been quite um, very, very, very helpful in that regard. Um, we also make sure that they have access to psychosocial support. Mm -hmm. So our community-based paralegals, they will be able to refer them to, to, for psychosocial support because to experience any uh, violence um, is a very, very traumatic experience. And therefore we need to look into the mental health challenges that come with, with, with experiencing such traumas. So those community-based paralegals are able to um, you know, refer them. We also um, refer them to institutions such as the legal aid especially women that want to leave um, the, the, these abusive relationships and start uh, di divorce processes, yeah. legal aid comes in and is able to, to assist them. So that is, is part of, of what we do and what these community-based paralegals do. Zindi, I want to ask you about access, mm. right? Because I know it is, we spoke about access being knowing. Mm. Right, so knowing what the legal process is, knowing what to expect when you're going to deport. But access is other, I mean, you're speaking about it right now. Access is also uh, not having transport to travel to town, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. right? Or wherever the services are that you need mm -hmm. to go to. Mm -hmm. Access is also having, when you're saying connecting them to legal aid, it's being able to have access to maybe the internet or have yeah. access to those phone numbers or know how to find it, mm -hmm. um, literacy. Mm -hmm. in terms of being able to read. So you want to go, you know, someone doesn't have an ID, they yeah. know they need to go to home affairs, but they can't read the form yeah. because they're not littered it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then another transport is just a huge one, yeah. right? Especially yeah. in GBV cases where you have to go up and down, mm -hmm. up and down, up mm -hmm. and down, all of the time. Mm -hmm. So when you speak about, um, when you speak about just having a paralegal in every community and increasing access to justice, does it mean these, is, does it take into account these things as well? And do you find in the work that you guys have done so far mm. that these are some of the reasons, these are some of the simple reasons why people just don't um, uh, engage with legal aid or home affairs and so forth? Definitely. So, for an example, through our court support program, um, we then, because we picked up that most victims, they will go and report, if that's if they go and report to the police, and say the case is, is on court roll, they need to appear on a particular date, and they just don't show up because they don't have funds to go. For an example, a victim that stays in Philippi mm. will most probably attend a court case in Weinbeck. How much is it to get to Weinbeck? 20 rand, 25 rand? And this is someone that is already unemployed, lives a poor, 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 poor life, and they have 20 rand or 50 rand with them, they're definitely not going to take that and spend it on transport to go to court. They'll spend that on buying bread, on buying milli meal. So there are those issues that we picked up and what we do is that we organize transport for them. And this is all thanks to the people that fund our work. Um, we're able to organize transport for them and I remember one of the uh, mothers of, of, of a victim on the case that is currently on court roll. They actually stay in Philippi. That's why I'm making an example uh, with yeah. the Philippi. And she had sent me a message to say, you know what, Sintle, I don't know how I can thank you guys because if it wasn't for you guys, I know that we would have never even went 
on the first day in court mm. after the suspect um, uh, was arrested. We would have never went to the bail hearing. We would have never been able to to just you know have some kind of support. Yes. Um, because they are really, really, really not able to afford anything, and so financial support has been very, very, very important. Having access to transport very, very, very important to make sure that you know justice is served. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to ask you the value of just having someone mm. with you mm. throughout this process because the process can also be a lonely one. I mean, there is family and some people are very blessed to have really supportive family members like mm. a mother, uncle or, or a great family to show up. But some mm. people are just alone. Yeah. And so, you know, what have you found? I mean, the paralegals themselves, they know this because a lot of them are survivors of gender-based violence. Mm. You have been through the system. We've mm. also spoken about it. Like, mm. what is the value of just having... Somebody to have your back, to hold your hand when, you, when you're going in there, and let's not forget, in a traumatized state, mm -hmm. right? It's very, very vulnerable. Just knowing that someone is there for you, someone understands what you're going through, and that someone will be walking through this very brutal path with you. It, it, it means a lot to, to, to victims and survivors that we, we get to work with and get to support. So just knowing that someone is there, it, it really, it, it encourages them to keep going, mm. to keep attending court cases. Mm. Um, and I've watched how some of um, our community-based paralegals actually interact um, with, with the victims. It's one of the most heartwarming experiences that you would have. Um, we, we don't interact with them as community-based paralegals but as victims and survivors of, of, of gender-based violence, even the conversations uh, that take place between our project beneficiaries and our community-based paralegals while waiting in a court, it makes, it makes the day go quicker mm. because um, sometimes, you know, in court you'll get there at half past eight and come 1 p.m. you are still there. And you can imagine um, if, you, it's, if it's just you and there's no one talking to you, there's no one talking to you in your language if there is anyone that is um, you know, talking to you. So it's quite a, a, a valuable um, you know, thing. Cindy, so you're a woman, you're a third year law student, right? You're engaging in this, in this, in this system. You're looking at like, what are the gaps? What is needed? Mm -hmm. That's actually my question. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, from you having a, a, being a survivor, working consistently now for a while with uh, survivors who are navigating the system as a third year law student who wants to go in and really make things better. What are the gaps? We, we, from, from your legal perspective, like where should we be focusing? It's a long journey, but what do you think are, are things that we need to sort of fix immediately? Well, the criminal justice system needs to definitely go back to the drawing board and find a, how can I put this? find them a, a, a proper way of how they can train police, you know, sensitize the police. Mm. Because the first contact um, of, you know, victims uh, when entering into the criminal justice system is most likely going to be with the police. And if anything goes wrong there, then the whole thing is just gets thrown off. Um, yeah. So they need, to, they need to look at how they, you know, recruit um, their police. I mean, look, just yesterday I was having a conversation with someone and I was saying that it's so sad that as a victim or as a survivor, you will, you will walk inside the police station going to report a case of this nature. And you must likely go into the reporting to another perpetrator because we know that police officers themselves are, are perpetrators of um, gender-based violence. And that is why maybe most of the time they don't even bother to adhere to the Sexual or Domestic Violence Act because they themselves are, are, are perpetrators. So, okay. looking at what mm. needs to change. And, that, and that's, an, a, that's an important part there. Also looking like who are the people taking the statements. Now we know also that recently, you know, there's supposed to be victim-friendly rooms, which you said you experienced sort of, mm. you know, in, in your own personal second experience, and we know that this was promised by the police minister and by the SEPs for the new gender-based violence desks that are being rolled out. But um, I think it's important really that you brought up 
uh, multiple times the sensitization of police and the importance of providing a safe environment for the victim in order to gather evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Because from your legal perspective, it is the gathering of evidence that is important mm -hmm. and memory is evidence. That's also something mm -hmm. that you sort of know, but for me, you don't frame it that way. The yeah. things that you remember, the names, the dates, where you were, like all of those things, those things are also evident. Mm. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned, and I think was, you know, court roles and postponements and sitting there, you know, the whole day. Are, are, are there sort of gaps in the court process also that you think we should be sort of closing right now? One or two yeah. or three things that you can just point out for us. Look, from sensitizing the police, we also need to sensitize court officials. Mm. There needs to be programs that are rolled out to bring to their attention the seriousness of how they, you know, treat victims and survivors when they are in, in, in these um, institutions. I think that there needs to be a training of just how to have good communication skills. Mm -hmm. Because the police don't have good communication skills. The people in court don't have good communication skills. Yes, they are very much educated, but um, they just lack good communication skills. Mm -hmm. Communicating is a simple thing as, look, today your court case will not happen. In fact, not just today, but maybe communicate prior, a few days before, to say that the, court will, uh, the case will not be processed today, so don't come to court. Exactly. Instead of and going so just... to court, you get there in the morning, and then only then they tell you. Mm. And that's also something that you know discourages people from actually going to court because I was at court yesterday, I was at court last week, nothing happened. If I go this week or if I go today, will something happen? Exactly. Most and likely I've not. All of that money and I've wasted time all of that money. And often taking time off work, etc. Zindi, I just want to bring it back before we go, because we don't have mm. very much time, to mm. the paralegal program. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's a program that they go through. How long is it? Uh, you know, can people get involved if yeah. they want to bring this program to the community? Like, tell us about the program. The program is a three months program. And what we do after the program, because, you know, when you're training, you're most probably doing a lot of theory. Yes. So what we do is that after the three months, they, they graduate. We have a whole graduation. It happens, it happens, and everybody comes out to fully late. Um, so what happens is that after that, three months training, we also take them in the organization on a, sort of an internship um, uh, basis. Okay. And yes, we give them stipends so they get to work, put into practice what they've learned yes. in training. And yeah, I mean, look, people can get involved. They can give us money, you know, they can donate yes. to the organization Definitely. so that we're able to continue to do this because we are quite limited in terms of resources. And those are actually financial resources. So if we can get that, people can definitely, uh, look, you can donate as little as 50 rand um, or 20 rand. It will definitely go a long way um, in helping us to, you know, have this program ongoing, on an yeah. ongoing basis. So definitely. But look, people can also volunteer. There are people who went and studied law, um, people who studied paralegal, specific, uh, uh, who specifically studied paralegal uh, work. And those people can come and they can volunteer and share their experience with our community-based uh, paralegals and, of course, with the community. And then if people want to get involved in the program itself, if they want to go through the three-month program, uh, work with your, your organization, or sort of kickstart sort of an informal paralegal thing in their community, mm. what is the process for signing up? Do they get in touch with you? Do they go to your website? Mm. They can definitely get in touch with us. We are very much active on social media, so we've got Facebook. We've got Twitter, we've got Instagram, we've got TikTok, uh, YouTube. Ah. Yeah, so they can definitely, um, you know, uh, go, go look us up on those social media platforms, follow us. And, and that's you know, the great people of South Africa. Yes, on right. Facebook, we are the great people of South Africa. On Twitter, it's the, at the great people too. Um, Instagram, it's at the great people underscore of underscore SA. And they can just simply go to www.thegreatpeopleofsa.co.za. That's our website. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. They'll be able to get see a lot of pictures as well there of our work and just get to understand more about the organization. Yeah. So they can definitely get in touch with us. And we'll be very much happy to hear from them. Zindli, I just wanted to ask one more question about um, the paralegal program and the paralegals themselves, who a lot of mm. them are... Uh, 
victims or survivors of gender-based violence themselves. And I do wonder, you know, what struck me is that, is this work not triggering for them? Um, and I think I'm asking this question because a lot of times after you've been through something, I think mm -hmm. I said earlier, we want to go in and make a change, right? Mm -hmm. We've experienced this, we've experienced a secondary trauma, secondary victimization like mm -hmm. you, we want to go in and we want to help mm -hmm. so that this doesn't happen to other people. Mm -hmm. But it is traumatic, it yeah. can be triggering. Um, how are the, I think, how do the paralegals who currently work for you, who have been victims of violence, sort of manage that? Yeah. Okay. So what happens with, with the people that are mostly uh, selected into the training is that they are usually our project beneficiaries. So they've been attending some okay. of our programs, especially the programs on, you know, community outreach programs on gender-based violence. And because they've attended some of our programs, they've gained the confidence of standing up and, and, and speaking about what happened to them, because we've also created a safe space in the community to say that people, you know, must speak out, um, where people can come and say, look, so can I just make an example quickly, actually, mm -hmm. of what I mean? In, in one of our programs last year, there is a woman that came, she turned 65 last year on the 4th of December. She came to the program, she had been coming to the program, and we were talking about sexual violence, and she stood up, and cried so much for the first time, we didn't know what was happening. And she said that she was so glad to be in our space because in 1971, sure. she was gang raped and she never spoke to anyone about it until that day at the program. So these are people that have been coming to our program who, like I said, have gained the confidence of being able to speak about what happened to them and they are ready to go out there and help other people, help them to speak out, help them to gain confidence in themselves to be able to navigate through this uh, uh, criminal justice system. So that's, that's what normally happens with people that come into the program. They maybe at first were unable to speak about what happened to them, but because they've attended this program and they've met other victims, they've met other survivors, they've gotten an opportunity to interact with me as well, and they think to themselves, well, if Zintla can do it, I think so can I. Mm. And that's where they, the whole spirit of wanting to, you know, um, help uh, other people, maybe even first start empowering themselves through the program and then helping other people. That's where, that's where it comes from. And so that's really powerful. You know, I'm thinking of one last thing that I want I to just cover before we go. You had said previously, and I think it was offline when we were having a conversation, mm -hmm. that, you know, when people approach you for help, it doesn't necessarily, they don't need to approach you only if they want to report, right? Mm -hmm. There's also an option to um, receive help, even if you choose not to report it to the police. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you gave your own example where you didn't initially report, and I think maybe five years later mm -hmm. or so, you decided to go and report it. And that is possible mm -hmm. to do later on, yep. right? Um, and so uh, I just want to confirm with you that that's also an option there to come and speak. I mean, this, this, powerful, um, this powerful declaration mm. from a woman who has kept something like that in for such a long time, I think mm -hmm. it represents a lot of people out there when we look at the history of gender-based violence in mm -hmm. South Africa mm -hmm. and across the world. There are so many. People come to me all the time yeah. since I've started the show doing sometimes first disclosures and there are mm -hmm. various reasons why mm -hmm. they chose not to report. The simplest reason being they didn't want to get into trouble. Yeah. Or they thought they were going to be victim blamed because they were mm -hmm. in the wrong place mm -hmm. at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, but what are the alternatives for people who choose not to report to the police but still need help? Yeah. They can definitely still come to us and tell us. Because what I always say is that you may not want to report to the police because of yourself, the broken trust that exists between the police and, and, and the community, but more, uh, more between the police and, and, and victims of gender-based violence. So if you don't want to report to the police, that's fine. You can come to us, tell us. Um, our community-based paralegals will take your statement, um, correctly so, put the information um, in a safe space. Um, if there needs to be pictures taken, we have specifically bought a camera just for that. Mm. We will take pictures um, and also again, working with other organizations such as Kwanele Foundation, they have an app. This app stores all the evidence so that if you need it 15 years later, like I said, there's no good time or bad time to report, you know, the crimes of gender-based violence or any crime, in fact, for that matter. Um, in this app, it, it, your information is stored there. And if ever 20 years uh, later or five days later or three months later, you want to 
um, you know, report to the police, then this form information already exists. It's, it's, it's right that we've kept it safe for you. Uh, and, and while we keep the information safe for you, we'll also make sure that you get all the necessary support like the social services. Yeah. I'm so sorry, we are out of time, but I want to thank you so very much for sharing your story with us and for being here. Only a pleasure. Thank you. We have to take a short break, but we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show, and we are almost at the end of our hour together. Now, we have been speaking about access to justice for victims and survivors of gender-based violence and the secondary trauma and secondary victimization that results when processes are not followed. Lawyers Against Abuse is another organization that is providing legal assistance to victims of gender-based violence. What they do, however, is a lot more than just representing victims. They look at the sort of full, holistic, psychosocial needs that a victim has when they've been through a traumatic, violent experience. We are going to watch a short video where they show what it is they do and how they help victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Let's have a look. I came to LVA because I needed counseling because I used to have something heavy on my shoulders. I was a lot sad, not happy at all. And I was that child who liked to isolate herself. It was a sad time. South Africa has some of the highest prevalence rates of violence against women and children anywhere in the world. Tragically, these prevalence rates just tend to multiply in communities like Deep Slut, the informal settlement where LVA works. The women and children that walk through our doors are usually people who've been through years of trauma. People who've lived through domestic violence for years, who've been raped. They've, they've gone through a lot of life. Lawyers Against Abuse is a nonprofit organization based in Dipsut, South Africa, and we provide an integrated response to gender-based violence. So we take a two-pronged approach, prevention and response. On the prevention side, we work in the community to raise awareness about people's rights and remedies and the available support services that are provided, while at the same time, we step in when violence has occurred to provide critical legal services and therapeutic support. Lawyers Against Abuse provides free legal services in the form of protection order assistance and also with our criminal case supports. Whichever routes our client chooses, we support them every step of the way. For a protection order, that's from the initial application to the point where they have the final protection order in their hands. In criminal cases of rape or assault, we accompany clients to the police station to open a case follow up with the investigating officer to ensure the case is moving forward, work with the state prosecutor, and support the client as she testifies at trial. Through this work, we also push for the law to be enforced and seek to hold state actors accountable for any misconduct. And violence can be seen as an act whereby someone abuses their power. So when we have clients coming into our organization, it's when they feel a sense of being disempowered, that they have lost a sense of power, and that then negatively then affects them by feeling ashamed, guilty, and also living with fear. We offer two forms of therapy within our psychosocial program. The first is a more traditional form of therapy known as talk therapy. The second, which is what I do, is called drama therapy. Through individual therapy, a client has the opportunity to foster resilience and emotional capacity. The community engagement team, um, we conduct our outreach in different ways. We go to clinics, we go um, to Sluge FM, where we do our segments once a month. We conduct sexual violence workshop with women aged 16 to 35. We also do door-to-doors do -door with community where we do one-on-one -on -one with them. 
um, letting them know about our, our work, our services, and also to know more about GP3. The hope that I have for my clients is for them to be able to build relationships where they live, whereby they don't have to live in fear, and they're able to trust and also feel like they have a sense of control over their life. And once when you see a client who's being able to do that, that is the ultimate uh, goal that we aim for. I think LVA is making a difference in our community because there are a lot of clients who come back and report to us that thank you for helping us. When we walk around the community, there are a lot of clients who want to give us feedback of the of how they went to court, of how the counseling was doing, how their family, they feel like they have to let us know as a community engagement. They let us know that they have been helped, they've been supported, they've been empowered by the team of LVA. At first I was isolating myself, but now I'm a better person. Life is good these days. Yeah, because I've been excelling at school and that's the one thing that is important to me. I have a lot of friends. I feel proud of myself. I feel a lot happy. After three weeks, there was a difference with me. Uh, I feel great and I feel happy and I'm just like Billy all the time. <laughs> Through our integrated and community-based approach, we ensure that victims have meaningful access to justice, that perpetrators of violence are held accountable, but most importantly, we ensure that no victim of violence ever has to walk this road alone. That was a short video on services provided to victims and survivors of gender-based violence. And that brings us to the end of our show. I think if I can pull out just a few points from our conversation with Zintle earlier, it would be, if you are assaulted, you choose whether to report or not. You do not have to report to the police, but if you choose not to report it to police, that you can capture some of the evidence, tell somebody, hold that, because you are able to report it even years later. And that's all we have for this evening. I'm Lumina Rasool. Goodbye.